Good evening and thank you for watching. My name is Cameron Sanchez. I'm the State Senate Reporter for the Arizona Capital Times in Phoenix, and I will be the moderator for this evening's debate. The Citizens Clean Elections Commission is the sponsor for this event. As the state's voter education agency, Clean Elections hosts debates so voters have the opportunity to hear directly from the candidates, ask questions on the issues that matter most to them, and vote informed. Candidates that have a contested primary election have been invited to participate in the debate. Candidates that have opted into the Clean Elections Clean Funding Program are required to participate, while traditional candidates are invited and encouraged to attend. Please note that candidates from both the Senate and House may be participating in the debate tonight. When voting in a primary election, voters are choosing between candidates of the same political party so their preferred nominee may advance to the general election. As a moderator, I will ensure candidates have the opportunity to engage directly with their respective opponents. The questions that will be asked this evening are coming directly from voters. Leading up to the debates, Clean Elections conducted outreach to voters across the state asking for questions for the candidates. Additionally, Clean Elections surveyed voters to learn what issues are important to them. This survey data, along with input from the experienced journalists at the Arizona Capital Times, Arizona Agenda, Green Valley News, and Salvarita Sun, have been utilized to guide the discussion so it best serves voters. Of course, we want to hear directly from you, the voter, so voters that are watching this debate live, you can submit a question at any time by email at debates at kc-a.com, texting 480-808-1814, or calling 480-937-1253. Please specify if your question is for a specific candidate or for all of the candidates. We screen questions for clarity to eliminate duplication, speeches, or personal attacks on candidates. The debate is scheduled for one hour, so we may not get to all audience questions, but we will do our best. Candidates, you will have one minute for your opening and closing statements and one to two minutes for your responses to voter questions. We encourage an open exchange of dialogue between opponents. If you feel the need to respond to another candidate's comments, you may do so. I may limit responses for time management purposes, and we remind the candidates and the audience that this is a respectful, courteous, and professional environment. Our goal tonight is to connect candidates and voters so our electorate may vote informed. Candidates running for the State House are John Gillette and Noel Rosen. The order in which candidates will speak has been determined by alphabetical order by last name for opening John comments Gillette, and will really progress really from that starting point. So, Mr. Gillette, would you like to start us off with your opening remarks, please? Hello, my name is John Gillette. I'm a retired Army Command Sergeant Major of 35 years. I started my political career uh, when COVID happened. I worked to open our schools. Uh, when our schools closed, it was devastating for our children. Uh, and I looked at our local county health director and found that she had a master's in marketing. And the COVID lockdowns were not consistent with the constitutional law, nor was it consistent with Arizona law. And I fought the school on that issue and they agreed and opened back up. And that kind of launched my political career uh, with people asking me to run for office, which I had no intent. I have no political background. I'm, I'm just an angry dad that was concerned over COVID and one of my kids back in school. Great, thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Rosen, opening statement, please. Yes, uh, my name is Noel Rosen, and uh, of course I'm running for the Arizona House in LD30. And I am a uh, Arizona resident for 44 years. I'm a biz small business owner, had my own small business for 20 years. I am a patriot, I am not a politician. And uh, I have fought for things like election integrity, which I'm still in, I'm still in the process of fighting for. Uh, I believe that we need to bring Arizona back to being a constitutional state. I am uh, a rural area candidate uh, from Wickenburg, Arizona. And I'm also uh, hopefully in my uh, first two years in the legislature, I hope to draft legislation to finally get rid of Common Core. I also have been uh, very much involved in uh, conservative, uh, I've mean, been a conservative activist. I am a constitutional conservative. So I believe that we need to bring Arizona back to being a constitutional state. All right, thank you very much. We're gonna get started with our first question. It's about border security. This is coming from voters. And the question is, when will the border wall or fence be built and finished. Mr. Gillette, let's go back to you. Well, we can't answer the question when it will be finished. It's obviously a construction project, a needed construction project that needs to be done right now. The federal government has stopped construction on the wall, limited what can be done. 
I do think Arizona needs to take up the construction of the wall on Arizona lands and on private property when, when they can. Uh, but more importantly, we need to reduce the demand on our state. Uh, when I say demand, I, I look at this as almost a drug, like a drug problem. The demand that we create as a state by giving uh, free everything to illegals, free housing, medical, transportation, that needs to end. I propose that we make uh, Section 8, 13, 24, A and B, which is a federal law saying it's unlawful to induce immigrants to stay in the country if you know they're illegal. I would like to make that a state law. I've spoken with many prosecutors and many attorneys. It is a court tested, Supreme Court tested law that's not being enforced by the Obama administration. Uh, we do need security on the border with the wall, but we also need to reduce the need to come here. With that, I would also raise a uh, tax on uh, remittance back to Mexico or whatever host nation, if the individual's illegal and they send back uh, US dollars through Western Union or what have you, whatever source they send it back, we would tax that at least at 50%. That would reduce the demand on our state. They, they would wanna go somewhere else. We can't continue to give every dollar of taxpayer money to illegals and leave our own citizens behind. All right, thank you. And we have another candidate joining us here, Representative Biasucci. I gave everybody else a minute for their opening statements. So if you'd like to unmute yourself and take a moment for that now, feel free. You're also muted. Okay, it looks like you might be having some trouble connecting. So I'm gonna go to you, Mr. Rosen. Same question, when will the border wall be built slash finished? Well, first of all, it'll be built when we actually get serious about the ish, the actual issue instead of kicking the can down the road. We need to build, uh, we, need, we can build the uh, border fence on state land. We do not need the, we do not need the federal government's permission to build on, to build, to finish the border fence. In fact, Scott Neely, who was running for governor, has actually offered to finish the border fence using his own, uh, his own team, his own uh, resources. And I think we need to take him up on it. It'll save the, the taxpayers a lot of, a lot of money, but we need to, we need to go with uh, the border plan that Brian Mache had actually come up with. He had actually has a solid border plan. It's to send the full weight of the Arizona National Guard and Air National Guard to the southern border along with the militia while the uh, border fence is uh, being built or, or being finished. I think that we really need to get serious. I mean, we're being invaded through this, uh, through the southern border. I don't call it illegal immigration. We are being invaded. Okay, this is a foreign invasion. And it's costing us a lot of money. And believe it or not, it's costing lives. So the, the, the bottom line is we need to finish that border fence. And like I said, we can do it on state land. We do constitutionally, we do not need the federal government uh, to, to build it. We can finish it ourselves. All right, thank you very much. Uh, Representative Biasucci, are you able to connect now at all? All right, I'm not hearing from him, so we're going to move on to the next question. And let's talk a little bit about the environment. So water conservation and drought has been a big issue in Arizona, especially this year. It's a big part of what looks like the budget is going to be. So let's talk about what we should be doing to conserve water or find new areas of water supply. And this time, let's start with you again, uh, Mr. Rosen. Well, first of all, we can do uh, uh, desalination. We actually do have a desalination plant in, in Yuma, actually. We can actually bring the water up from, uh, from Mexico, the dirty water. I would not get it from the cartels. They want to build a desalination plant and uh, they're in Mexico and pipe the water up to us. Desalination is a, an option, but it is a very expensive option. Um, the other option that we have is just to simply pray, pray for rain. I mean, God brings the water, but the bottom line is that we live in a desert. 
and we're always going to have a water issue. And we have more and more people that are moving into the state and that taxes our resources. So right now, the only option that we really have is desalination, but that is a problem. We can probably pipe the water in from, from California and at least uh, the pipeline will be somewhat secure because within the United States, but the bottom line is, is that the water issue is always going to be an issue. We live in a desert. And so, like I said, it's not an easy, it's not an, uh, a solution that can be easily solved right now. But, you know, like I said, if there's any other options, God knows the options. And he's, he actually controls the faucet that makes the rain, the rain, that makes the rain happen. So other than that, I don't think that there's there's much of anything we uh, we have. We have over you know beef, you know we have over forestation. We have a lot of uh, you know the trees that are being you know that that we've been over we've overly planted on trees. So we've got a lot of fires, and that's eat, that's going to eat up and tax up water resources. Um, of course, we can uh, actually with it with the um, controlled forestation we can actually cut down those trees that are failing and of course we'd have a lot we'd have some you know a lot less fires but the bottom line is desalination may be the only option we have at the table at this particular moment in time but it is an expensive option all right great and now mr gillette same question to you how do we conserve water how do we find new sources of water and how do you feel about desalination uh, this is a multi-pronged approach. Uh, not, there is not one simple answer. Number one, I support the pipeline. I've talked to people from the Department of Interior and, and uh, Reclamation. Mississippi River in the Saint, greater St. Louis area floods every other year to the point where uh, the, the greater St. Louis Gateway Arch floods up to the steps and sometimes into the building. There are still farms and commercial buildings underwater there since the floods of 1993. They just quit trying to levy the water and let it flow. Uh, we can remove that water with a pipeline system to the Denver, Colorado area and dump it right into the Colorado River. With the pipeline, the pipeline would require pumping stations and filtration sta stations. The Mississippi River is dirty. The water is full of nitrates. The pumping stations and filtration statements or stations would filter the nitrates out, uh, giving us natural and reusable fertilizer to use in our farms, plus create tons of jobs. It is a viable project. The Department of Interior and uh, BLM and Reclamation have looked at this for about 20 years, and that, that's been on the table for over 20 years. Even some of the easements on federal property and along highways have already been secured. So that is one prong of the approach. Uh, desalination, I agree, is is an option. We do have the plant in Yucca, but the plant in Yucca doesn't run all the time. It's run very scarce. Uh, it's used more of a training facility from what I gather from talking to people that actually work there. They train other entities on how to use desalinization. It, the country of Israel, we need to contact them, connect with them. Uh, they're they're world-class champs at desal. They, they yeah, use desal for our entire, our, their entire country. Uh, we can connect with them, use some of our brilliant people, some of their brilliant people. I would like to see a desal plant in California that feeds California's water needs uh, and turn off the pipeline. We're still working on a water treaty from 1922, uh, which Mexico has violated. Uh, because some of the trade agreements and some of the other tenants in that 1922 agreement uh, with technology and, and whatnot, they, it's no longer a viable treaty. I would turn the water off to Mexico. We've asked them to control their border. We've asked them to help stop the flow of fentanyl and other dangerous drugs into our country. They've done no, no such thing. They've not lifted one finger to help us. So I would shut that water off. I know it's not a, a very uh, nice option, but it is a viable option. The water we send to California, most of that water goes into the ocean. It's used by, far by farming, it's used in cities along the way, but the majority of that water from all accounts goes into the ocean. So bringing the water, a new source of water in. Now I spoke earlier today as an old right. on deforestation. Um, the Sierra Club is pretty much all but banned 
uh, logging in Northern Arizona. The watershed and the refill in Northern Arizona has been lessened by uh, the number of trees per acre. It used to be about 600 with logging, now it's well over 1,100, and those extra trees use a lot of water. But failing trees even take more water, plus they leave the ground covered, so the snow melt doesn't enter the same way that it used to. A lot of it is runoff, goes into storm drains, and it's not recaptured. As far as reutilization and saving of water, we've got to recapture every drop of water that we use. Wastewater, groundwater, rainwater, put that in reservoirs, uh, treat all of our wastewater, and pump it back into the system. All right, we, Mr. We after farming. Yes? You're, you're coming up on three and a half minutes here, and I'm trying to limit you guys to the one or two minute mark. Okay. So uh, I'm well, asking to wrap it up. The water question is a multi-pronged approach. We could go on all day about it. Yes, sir. All right, so let's talk a little bit about water in the broader sense of the budget, because this year we have a lot of money to spend, um, and it looks like there's going to be a fair amount invested in water. So if you had the power in the legislature this year, you had an extra, let's say, $5.3 billion to spend, where would you be putting that money? Uh, Mr. Rosen, back to you. Where would I put the money of uh, the, the $5.3 billion? Yes. Well, actually, the, the, the budget... I think we need to take a little uh, solid look at the budget. It's almost $16 billion. That's what they're going for. Where I would actually put the money is half the money is actually going into education. We, that's insane. We actually have roads that actually need to be fixed. Okay. We spent, we're going to spend a lot of money on the water issue, but the problem is that we have roads that need to be fixed as well. And there's a whole, whole lot of COVID money that, that our state got that's in the state treasury. And, you know, the bottom line is, is that if, you know, without infrastructure, we're, we're failing. I mean, obviously we have to, we have to fund the board, we have to fund the border fence. I do not believe that we have to um, give so much money to these schools. I'd like to know where they're actually spending this money. Okay, it's some of it seems to be apparently going into administration. So really, the reality is, is we got roads that we do need to fix, and where this money needs to go is, like I said, border defense is one of the is one of the is one of the factors right there. We also have to um, we also have to fix the roads. I mean, infrastructure is a very very vital part here in Arizona, and I'd like to know where our legislature is spending of it is actually going into and i actually talked to, to senator kerr today she said it was actually around 50 percent it was going into education which is insane um you know it's almost like they are taking our money and give it you know and basically blowing it like a sailor at sea and it's and it, the taxpayers lose out okay there's a lot of issues the education we've got the roads uh the book got the border the border issue has to be solved that's num that's Number one, we have to also investigate a lot of these agencies that are wasting our money. Now we have obviously have to give some money for law enforcement because we have to have law, law and order. But the bottom line is also we have to stop sending money overseas. Believe it or not, our state sent resources to the Ukraine. Okay, that's insane. And, uh, you know, because our money is supposed to be used for the common defense of our country and for uh, the common good for our country not being sent overseas. So the bottom line is take your pick on where you think the money should be spent. But it's insane that they're spending so much money on education. Um, not that I'm against education, but I think it's I think it's, it's insane the amount of money that they are spending on education. All right, thank you. Um, Mr. Gillette, let's go back to you on this one. So there's an extra 5.3-ish billion dollars in the budget this year. Where should it go? And do you think that it should go to water, infrastructure, border security, et cetera? Uh, yes, that's pretty simple. Uh, we, we've got to fund the water project, whether it be a desal plant in Mexico or a desal plant in um, California to give a fresh water supply to those entities that we're giving water to, and maybe to, to pump some of that water back over here. We, we've got to create new sources of water. I would spend money on that. The border security is, is by far uh, one of the bigger issues as well. Water and border, 
must be taken care of. I would fund the wall to be put up wherever it needs to be put, especially in the key traffic areas. But again, on my border program, I would like to see some laws, uh, the 1324 A and B enacted to make it unlawful to induce an alien to stay in the country. I believe if we start punishing criminals using the federal law at the state level, make it a state law and use that law, we will reduce the number of people crossing. That with the border wall, I think that, that problem, uh, it may exacerbate the problem in other states, but I'm concerned about our state and our district. Um, they could do the same thing if they wish. If the federal government is not gonna jump in and help us out as they are uh, supposed to, and, and actually uh, part of their charter is to stop the, an, a foreign invasion into our country, if they're not gonna do it, we, we have to act using the 10th Amendment. Um, we talked about this at our earlier debate, debate today, uh, schools. Yes, a large part is going to administrative cost. A large part is going to comply with federal transportation rules. And we do spend uh, uh, an enormous amount, I think it was 28% in the last budget uh, on schools. 28% of the entire state budget on schools, but yet we rank 46th in the nation. Uh, 42nd in some areas, but overall 46 K through 12. That's not acceptable. We're spending half of the state budget and we're, we're getting nothing for our money. We're getting a last place in the nation. Uh, and you can't tell me Arizona kids are not as smart as kids in other states. We obviously have a problem with how education is being administered. When it comes down to curriculum, which I would attack the, the curriculum as well, but the, the bloated spending. Uh, one example, uh, we did a survey at Mesa High School with uh, six assistant principals and one main principal. Uh, I think it was four counselors. You know, that's over a million dollars in salaries and benefits just for administrative needs. And that money is not going to the teachers. So we're losing good teachers, experienced teachers for new teachers that may not be doing such a great job or come in with a, an ideology of this indoctrination. And, and that's why we're not placing well uh, amongst the other states. We also have a school quality issue with the infrastructure of the schools not being great. And you know, we all complain about roads and bridges uh, and it is a thing, it is a serious thing. I lost a, uh, a tire sensor on the way back from uh, Colorado River event this weekend on Highway 93 outside of White Hills, a big tourist area on the way to Hoover Dam and Grand Canyon. The road is so bad that it damaged my truck. This has got to be, this has got to be stopped. We have over a million people a year going to the Grand Canyon and the roads are, are, are horrid. We've got to get some state money. We've got to get some federal money. We've got to take care of our infrastructure. All right. So I heard education coming up from both of you in there. Uh, let's talk a little bit about ESAs or empowerment scholarship accounts. Do you believe that those ESAs should be expanded, expanded universally? Uh, Mr. Rosen, back to you. Um, I didn't quite hear the question. What, what was the question again? Yes, so it's should ESAs, which are empowerment scholarship accounts, also sometimes called vouchers, uh, be expanded. They allow students who would and they usually attend a public school to attend a private school with that taxpayer money. Okay. Uh, yeah, I believe in following the backpack. Parents should have a choice on where they send their kids to school. Um, you know, if a, a parent, it's all up to the parents, really. The parents are the ones who decide where they send their kids to school. And they can, I believe in the voucher program, that they actually should be able to get the best education um, that uh, they can pay for. I mean, it, it is really up to the parent, it's really up to the parent to decide where the kid goes to school. Um, but I do not believe, I mean, the public schools right now are, are indoctrination centers. That's basically what they are. They're teaching a lot of Marxism. They're teaching, um, you know, they, we need to get rid of Common Core. That's a, that's a big part of my, of my candidacy is getting rid of Common Core, which has caused uh, things like critical race theory and caused things like uh, comprehensive sex education, which is CSE. But the bottom line is, is that I believe that a parent, if a parent wants to send their kid to a private school, there should be a voucher program for it, and there is. Follow the backpack. I am a big, big fan believer in that because the parents should have a a hand in where their kids go to school and they have the parents deserve uh, a choice for their kids 
you know, for school, whether it and also if they do, um, for example, um, you know, in-home teaching, which they basically, uh, you know, take them out of the public schools and they're actually uh, teaching them at home uh, that, you know, there there are, uh, I believe, resources that should be directed towards that as as well, uh, as well as, you know, be able to send them to a charter school if that's what they want to do or a private school. So I also, I absolutely believe that that's parent has a choice on whether they do homeschooling or they they send them to a uh, private school if that's what they want to do. But I believe there should be money for that. A parent should have a choice. Thank you. That sounds like a resounding yes on ESA expansion to me. Mr. Gillette, would you like to respond? Do you agree, disagree? I agree. Yes on the vouchers, yes on school choice. Uh, the taxpayer has to follow the child. It, the only way that we make these failing schools better is by competition. We live in a free market economy. Um, the school that performs better will take the, the lion's share of the children in that area. Uh, therefore, they're going to get more money, now, whether it be through a voucher or whether it be through state funding. Uh, charter schools, My I have seven-year-old twins. My kids go to a sc charter school. We are quite happy with it. We're happy with their, their small budget, their small administration budget, I should say. Um, they do a wonderful job. They don't push any of the, the crazy agenda, but what they do is they do more with less budget money. They don't get the federal or they don't get the state reimbursement for uh, federal transportation guidelines. They don't get lunch money. They don't get a lot of the other funding that schools do, but yet they outperform. Uh, that's why our charter school here is constantly full. The classes are at maximum capacity. Uh, that's that's uh, very telling on how they do business. You know, we we here in Kingman, uh, I live in the King, Kingman region, so most parents that can, we will try to get our kids into charter schools. There's a big misconception about charter schools being uh, paid for by tuition. It is not. As you know, it's a public school, uh, and if you can get in, based on class size, you're in. And once you're in, you're generally there. They don't remove a student. Uh, there's a waiting list. So it's, it's a very fair, equitable way to get your kids in a good school. If we made all the schools compete the same way a charter school would, uh, the schools will get better. They'll be forced to get better. I'm going to send my kids to the school that I get the biggest bang for my buck and think that their education is, is above the, the 42 or 46, whichever demographic you're looking at. Uh, in the state. Uh, I'm not big on the, the placement test. Uh, I think the parents should be able to choose school choices, the answer, and competition creates better schools. All right, thank you. Um, one of the problems we've been seeing in Arizona over the last few years is that there are experienced teachers who either leave their profession or leave the state. As a representative, what would you do to ensure that high quality teachers are staying in Arizona classrooms? And let's keep this on you, Mr. Gillette. Well, I, I was just speaking about that uh, the other day, and I talked to our administration. I talked to a couple of teachers. Uh, there were several teachers, new teachers, that had to skip a raise because if they took the raise, that would take them off access. Nobody should should debate in, in their own private life whether they should take health care or a couple of dollar an hour raise. So at, at some point, we're going to have to look at teacher salary cut administrative costs, give more money to the good teachers on a merit-based system. I am not for the teachers union paying uh, the same amount across the board for every single teacher. If you have a school that's doing a great job and those teachers are winning and, and they are performing above their peers, they should have a salary above their peers. But we can't have teachers start, uh, new teachers start at the lowest level and come in and have to debate whether they accept a raise or they, they forego healthcare costs because they can't afford both. So if they come off act access, they have to go on the school healthcare plan if the school has one or go on a private plan and they just, they can't afford that. Uh, one teacher told me that if she were to take the raise and come off access, she would have to pay $900 a month in healthcare costs. That, that's, that's more than some mortgages in our area, especially with our, uh, in Kingman itself, the median household income is $44,000 a year. You had Lake Havasu, Bullhead, um, the, the three big cities in Mojave County, you add that in, you come up to 52,000, but 
that's right on the borderline of access to Medicaid, Medicare. So this is something that we've got to look at to in place. There's uh, a tax break by local cities, counties for new teachers to move to the area. I uh, my key totally is appropriate. Here's <clears throat> Am I still on? You're good, Mr. Rosen. I'm hearing a little bit of sound from you. Maybe uh, when Mr. Gillette is speaking, if you could mute yourself, that would be great. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Uh, I, I hear I'm that. I, I, I've got a something's going on here. Maybe a bandwidth issue. Yeah. But I seem to be back. Uh, but that's pretty much my answer. I do support the vouchers. I support school choice. Uh, the money has to follow the child. So if I take my child out of the charter school and put them in another school, that tax dollar should follow that child. Great, and Mr. Rosen, uh, speaking about teachers in Arizona who leave the state or leave their jobs, how do we keep our teachers here? Do we give them raises? Please respond. Well, well, I, I honestly think that the good teachers, I'm not talking about the bad ones, but the good ones, um, they should get a higher salary. They, I mean, they, I don't think the a lot of the big salaries should be going to the administration, should be going to the teachers, okay? And I'm talking about the good ones. But I also think that the bad ones that are trying to that that are all down with uh, with all the leftist Marxist agenda that they have keep pushing on students, I honestly believe we should dump them. Okay, we do need to get rid of Common Core, which has caused a lot of these problems. We've had good teachers that have actually left the school system because of a lot of the leftist garbage. Okay, they just want to teach. We need to go back to traditional learning. We need to put God back into the schools. We need to go ahead and actually, I mean, when I went to school and back in the old days, I mean, we learned things about the Constitution. We learned things like history. We learned things about, you know, regular science, cursive writing, English, you know, uh, you know, the basic math. I mean, we learned all that. Okay, we need to put that back into the schools. And one of the things that I believe that if these teach, you know, the, the bad ones, okay, should not be getting... You know, it's like John said, there is a merit-based system, and I do believe in that. Okay, you do good work, you get rewarded for it. You know, that's how you get a, that's how you get a raise. But the bottom line is, is that we got a lot of teachers that are teaching a lot of the leftist garbage. It needs to stop. Those are the ones we need to dump. And you keep the good ones, okay? Because when you keep the good ones, guess what? If you give, if you also give them the right benefits, guess what? They're going to be retained. That's what you want, okay? Um, it's a shame that some of them are, on, you know, having to deal with the access system because they're not being paid enough, okay? They do deserve a raise, but like I said, it's not a raise across the board. You, it's for the good ones, not the bad ones. I think it's pretty simple of what we need to do with the school systems. The administration, it was like uh, pointed out earlier, you know, you have, uh, what, six vice principals in a school, and that's ridiculous. I mean, you narrow them down to one, okay? Then you, got then you got more money for the students, okay? Because that's really the future that we're teaching. But we cannot indoctrinate these kids, okay? And the bottom line is that with all the money that is going into education, which is half, which is 50%, I mean, like I said, that is insane. So the teachers, the good ones, I think deserve – more of a raise than these administrators because we've got poor administrators too in the school system. They don't deserve to be rewarded. Reward the good teachers, give them the benefits. Guess what? You're going to have better students if you keep the good ones. If you keep the good teachers, you're going to have better students because these kids will learn. All right, thank you. I'm hearing some stuff here about uh, liberals and liberal policies. Let's talk about bipartisanship. Is that a dirty word or would you feel comfortable working across the aisle if you were elected to public office, Mr. Gillette? Bipartisan uh, is, is not a dirty word. You need teamwork, but there, there are some issues that we're just not gonna find common ground on. Um, I guess I'm gonna the, have to the water issue. Uh, if I can find someone that, that understands water, um, the smart engineer, whether they're Democrat, Republican, whatever, uh, other than a communist, we, we have to work together to solve the water problem. Uh, obviously, a communist is not going to work to solve that problem because they want to control that. But <clears throat> yes, there are certain issues that, that 
uh, are bipartisan. Water uh, education should be one of those issues that's, that, that's not bipartisan, but unfortunately that, that is very partisan. And the, the school unions, the teachers unions, uh, I don't think that I will see eye to eye with many of their supporters. Um, and, and that's fine. We all have our opinion we have our, our backgrounds, but I think water is an across the board issue. Security is across the board issue. Um, there, there are some in the Democrat wing of the party and in the liberal wing of the party that, that are pro second amendment. Most of them are not. Uh, and if, if it took a vote, to forward our Second Amendment rights, which Arizona, thanks to uh, the incumbent Leo uh, Biasucci, you know, passing the Second Amendment sanctuary, uh, that, that's a good thing. But right now, the polarization in politics is so heavy, I, I don't even think if we could agree on water, I don't think either side would come together on water. I think they would push it aside to maintain their position within the party, and that's a shame. All right, thank you very much. Mr. Rosen, let's talk about bipartisanship. How do you feel about working with those across the aisle? Well, if you get the parties out of the way, um, it's all about working with, uh, it's all about working um, uh, for the people and for the betterment of the people. And I think that that is very much a, I mean, that's a very bipartisan issue, okay? You've got the environmental stuff. I don't know if we're ever really going to agree on everything environmentally. Water, we all agree that we need it to survive. Okay, we all agree that we live in a desert and we need to solve that problem. But as far as the constitutional state is concerned, the left does not believe in that. Okay, but I'm still going to work across the aisle, even with people that I may not even like. It's about doing what's best for the people not the parties, okay? We need to get the parties out of the way, okay? Um, the border issue should be definitely a very bipartisan issue. I mean, uh, protecting our, our sovereignty, the, defending our country, that should always be a bipartisan issue. Unfortunately, it's become a partisan issue of sorts. <clears throat> Um, you know, in regards to education, that also should be a, you know, a bipartisan issue. Um, I, will I work across the aisle to make sure that certain things get done? Absolutely. I mean, we can't get anything done if we're consistently fighting each other. And this is what's happened. There's a division, Democrat and Republican. But I do know that they, you know, there are issues that I know that are very, very, uh, that you can work together with the left on. And now one of it is actually in, in, in environmental issues, obviously. Also issues regarding animals, okay? You know, animal cruelty is an issue I think I know I can work with the other side on, that they'll easily work with me on, okay? But as far as the defense of our country, the problem is, is that they've let the parties dictate everything. It's supposed to be the people working together. We're supposed to come together as Americans. I, I see that. I, I mean, there's such a split in our country. But yes, I will work across the aisle with anybody who wants to work with me, the betterment of our state and our country. That's what we're supposed to be doing as representatives. Thank you very much. So I heard someone speaking about the Second Amendment earlier, and that's an important topic that's been in the discussion lately. It's also something that the US Congress is currently discussing. Uh, I remember the governor recently proposed a red flag law. It's something that he's discussed before and having in Arizona. Um, would you support a red flag law? Do we need gun control in the form of a red flag law, Mr. Gillette? Absolutely not. Uh, red flag laws are generally enacted prior to due process, and that's something that is contrary to the Constitution. Um, the Constitution, the, the framers, and the Supreme Court agree in the exact verbiage, if a law is created that is repugnant to the Constitution, that law shall be deemed void. Um, the Constitution is clear. The Second Amendment is very clear. It's plain and simple writing. Um, you know, we can talk about the tragedies that have recently occurred. It's not a Second Amendment problem. That is a, a, uh, a mental problem or a, a health problem created by uh, the current social agenda. 
Uh, we have broken homes. We have most of these kids have been loners. They've been involved with drugs, other crimes, and laws that are already on the books were not enforced. And if they were, they probably would have not passed the background check. They would probably be already in the system. Um, just like the kid that uh, was responsible there, he had several run-ins with law enforcement. He'd actually been arrested, but they chose not to prosecute and give him a pass to try and bring him back into the fold of society that, you know, the acceptable norms. If the very simple laws that were passed there would have been enforced, he would have never been able to get a lawful gun. And that's what we're really talking about. Uh, the red flag laws, uh, if I've read many different versions of the red flag laws from a lot of states, some states you can actually call in on the phone, give no evidence, no credible threat, and just say, I think this person is a, cell, is, is a danger to themselves or others, and the police will go take their weapons. That is not due process. That's not what the founding fathers intended, and it is contrary to the Second Amendment. All right, thank you very much. Uh, same question to you, Mr. Rawson. Absolutely, Don, I am against red flag laws, okay? Um, you know, it's funny that, that, this, that this issue has come about because I think our founding fathers were very specific in what the Second Amendment was all about, shall not be infringed, okay? It is a God-given right to have are to be able to defend ourselves is a God-given right for us to be able to have that firearm. And basically the, um, the bottom line is that uh, if somebody has a problem with someone and let's say they have an argument with their neighbor, it's very easy for that neighbor who's against the second amendment to say, well, that neighbor shouldn't have a firearm. Okay. It'll be very easy for them to say that. And, and it's like John had mentioned, that without any kind of due process, without any kind of clear evidence that they are un, you know, mentally unstable, it's not for us to decide who is mentally unstable. You know, I know quite a number of people that, that may be, you know, they may shout something that they, you know, or get in a, in a fight. But that doesn't mean that they should have their firearm taken away from them. And a doctor, you know, it's also the, a problem because a doctor can say, you know, that's, that's how this whole thing started. It was in the medical industry. And they basically said to a doctor, well, you know, you, they wanted you to disclose whether or not you had a firearm. And they figured that's the way that they can actually take your gun because they can easily mark somebody as saying, well, he's got a firearm. He's mentally unstable. He, should, he shouldn't have it. The bottom line is that the red flag laws – that's a real no-no with me. Shall not be infringed is in our Constitution. I mean, that's a part of the Second Amendment. There are other pieces, another component to, to, uh, to the Second Amendment. But I believe that, you know, every citizen should be armed. Every citizen should have that, that uh, well, it's not an option. It's really a God-given right. So the bottom line is the red flag laws, I'm against them. And, you know, the mental health, you know, issue, first of all, this is the problem that we have in our country. We have people that would rather blame the tool than the person who's actually wielding that tool. Okay. So I, you know, it's, it's funny how the left will always say that it is the firearms fault for what the person does. That's like saying that if you give a spoon to a person and they have ice cream, that's what makes them fat. Okay, the bottom line is, is that I am against red flag laws, absolutely, and, you know, they need, they need to go. And anybody that's even thinking about a red flag law shouldn't really be in office. All right, thank you. Moving away from that and into an entirely unrelated topic, here's a voter's question for you. If elected, would you support bills such as 2022's HB 2254, which is about terminally ill individuals, end of life options. It's commonly known as a medical aid in dying, which would allow terminally ill adults the ability to obtain a prescription for a life ending drug. If you don't support it, what do you say to someone facing terminally ill uh, life ending symptoms, Mr. Gillette? 
Well, I have a unique perspective on this. I, I am personally, uh, based on my yeah, religion, thanks. I, I'm a Christian, and I don't believe anyone should take their own life. But my wife is a healthcare provider, and, and she has told me the struggles of a lot of people that are terminal, they're living in pain, and they're suffering. Um, I personally don't subscribe to it, but if, if someone is in that much pain and their quality of life is such that they they don't feel that they can continue, I, I don't think the state or we should, as a society, mandate that they can't finish their life with some dignity and, and do what they see as right. I know other states have it. Uh, I haven't looked into, into it in depth, but... Uh, I, I'm thinking of a soldier I served with that lost both arms, both legs, um, was brain damaged, could understand and hear, but couldn't act, couldn't speak, couldn't do anything. And, and it was his will to end his life due to his every day and pain and suffering, laying on a bed, not able to do anything. It's not my call to take that away from him. That's that's between him and God. not not any judicial or um, political system. All right, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Rosen, same question to you on euthanasia. Medical aid in dying, should we allow it in Arizona? Why not? We actually have it with our animals. You know, when they're quality, when they're suffering, if they're in pain, suffering, you know, that in other words, they have an illness that is so debilitating that it diminishes their quality of life. It's a humane way of, of, of handling the situation. It's really kind of funny that this issue has become an issue because we don't think twice about doing that for our pets. When, you know, I've had, you know, it's a hard thing. It's a hard decision to make. It really is a hard decision to make. I mean, it's like, um, it's like John said, with a person doing it, that's between them and, you know, they're going to have to deal with God on that issue. But it is a choice. We start taking away choices. I don't think the government should have any right to step in and stop that choice. Okay, because that is a choice that we are making. And, and somehow, I really feel like, we, you know, we, we treat our animals sometimes better than we treat ourselves. And to be honest, I, I really do think that, um, you know, it, there's nothing wrong with it. I really think that there's that there's nothing wrong with it. I don't think the state should be stepping in and telling somebody what they feel is best for themselves or their loved ones. So absolutely, I think that uh, I would have no problem. I mean, euthanasia is a very, it, it can be a harsh word. You know, there are other ways that we deal with it with our pets. Like we say, hey, we, we're, we're going to put them to sleep. But the bottom line is, I mean, I, I don't know if there's an easy word for it. Um, some would call it assisted suicide, and that sounds really bad. But the problem is, is that if they are in such pain and their quality of life is so diminished that they are going to pass, I think the humane thing to do, we do it for our pets. We need to be there for our loved ones and give them the same options. All right, I think you guys have agreed about just practically well, everything today. I, I would like to disagree on one point. Uh, I, this, this question is about euthanasia on human beings. Uh, I, I'm an animal lover. We have four dogs. Um, it, it is a different issue. The Founding Fathers gave us the Ninth Amendment. Uh, their wisdom in the Ninth Amendment is the People's Amendment. The Tenth Amendment mm -hmm. is for the state rights. The um, what is not taken by the state and the federal government is the Ninth Amendment. It doesn't have to be enumerated to be a right. Uh, I mean, there is no euthanasia law on the books or, uh, or in the Constitution. It's not mentioned. So just because it's not mentioned doesn't mean it's not a right that can be observed by uh, a member or a citizen of this country. And that's, that's the legal position on it. Uh, I know states jump in and take it up as one of the state's issues, but uh, that's your Ninth Amendment right. That That is between you and God. Thank you. Mr. Rosen, would you like I, to... And I, I, want to say, I want to say this. I, I understand John's position that this is not about animal euthanasia. I get it. But what I was trying to do was cite an example. We give that choice. 
to our animals because we, some of us consider our animals our loved ones. Some people don't have, they don't have children. Some people don't have kids. But the bottom line is, I don't believe it's up to the state to decide for what's best for us or our loved ones. And that is kind of why I, I cited that example. Okay, we can agree on that. All right. Let's move on. Let's talk about homelessness. Uh, Arizona has rising rents and we have an influx of people coming in. How do we keep affordable housing affordable? Uh, do we need to do anything to keep affordable housing affordable? And let's go to you, Mr. Gillette. This, this is a tough question. Now, I, I do work in real estate now. I flip homes. I sell homes. Uh, the homelessness problem is a huge problem. We have so many veterans on the street on any given day. And, and we do work with them. We, I work with a private organization. We try and help out uh, the homeless vets and get them off the street. But a lot of the homelessness is, is not economic homelessness. It's, it's mental health issues. And that, that's, that's the root cause of a lot of the homelessness. I talk to a lot of the homeless. Uh, it is an issue. Now, you're, you're putting homelessness and affordable housing in together. There is a little bit of that. If you go back to the 1970s, 64% of Americans identified as middle income. Um, right now, today, it is much lower than that. It's about 29% would qualify as middle income. Uh, the housing issue, it is a market. The market will rise, the market will fall, but the root cause of a lot of the, the housing issues is redistribution of wealth. And we saw this in the beginning of the Obama years where people that are not really qualified to get the home uh, same in the Clinton years, not really qualified to get the home, uh, end up getting a home, can't sustain the payment, then it goes into foreclosure. Uh, and right now we're seeing just the opposite where people that are qualified are, are really not getting the homes uh, due to economic factors. But we have corporations and, and larger entities coming in to buy housing and they buy housing for the sole purpose of making it Section 8 housing because they know they have a guaranteed income. They know if the house is destroyed, the government will, will take care of it. And the, the housing market, when it's in flux like this, people will buy houses that are complete junk, fix them up just enough that they meet the Section 8 guidelines, and the house is sold to the government at the market rate. Even though that market rate is hugely inflated, but now that house is purchased and it's ended up being rented, uh, and I have no problem with Section 8 for those who need it, but you, you shouldn't be buying, you know, 20 houses in a row and making them all Section 8 housing and, and having uh, an entire demographic and neighborhood and part of the city changed by uh, short-term rentals and Section 8 housing. People are giving up more and more of their income in other ways, uh, especially to illegals, uh, more social programs, all these programs that are taking away money from citizens cause them to slip from the middle class. We need to let people keep more of their money, attain that middle class status so they can buy an affordable home. All right, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Rosen, same question to you. I'm gonna narrow it down to speak specifically about affordable housing since I realize that homelessness is a separate issue sometimes. Well, affordable housing, that's an issue that's, that's kind of a private industry issue. Um, because it is very tough. I live in, in Wickenburg, and I can tell you honestly, uh, there isn't a lot of housing. And a lot of what I'm seeing is a lot of flood of people uh, coming in from other states, and they're buying up properties. Some of them are companies. Some of them are corporations. They're buying these homes, and they're basically forcing some of these people out of their homes. And they're basically uh, renting them at a higher at a higher rate. Um, I can tell you honestly, I rent, and it's gotten very tough for me to actually find, uh, you know, housing that's affordable. I think one of the things that we can do to really stay off this uh, this thing with the affordable housing is we've got a lot of people that also are coming in from foreign countries. I don't believe the foreign. I don't think it, that anybody that lives that is from a foreign country should be allowed to own property here. Okay. Um, and of course with the affordable housing, the rents are really high right now. I got my rent kicked up. Okay. So I'm kind of living in that, that whole rental situation where I would love to buy a home, 
but it's not it's not really affordable and it's tough because i've got uh a you know where i live in the apartment complex i live in we have a uh an honest two, a couple of owners from california apparently that basically um said hey we're going to kick the rents up to about fourteen hundred dollars a month which is not really affordable because there's a uh, low income housing tax credit stuff that that uh there are there in regards to affordable housing there's low income housing tax credit properties that kind of helps to a certain degree but when those properties actually opt out of the program then what happens is, is that you, there's no place for you to go you either have to pay high, you either have to pay a higher rent or you have to find uh some means for housing um, here in the rural areas, because I'm living in a rural area, um, with affordable housing, that actually became a, a big issue. We have people that come that that want to live in Wickenburg where they work, but they can't do that because the rents are so, the rents and affordability is so high. So what they have to do is they have to commute from like Surprise up here. But we also it's very hard to tell private landowners, you know you know, what they can uh, uh, rent their properties at. I mean, there should be some kind of cap. I would love to actually work with some of these places and actually see if there's some way to to, to, to put a cap on this. Now, uh, Section 8, it's really kind of funny because the property that I live in uh, does have Section 8 people. And they're basically dumping low-income housing tax credit people, which actually are paying a good portion of the rent, they're dumping those people and they're keeping people that are on section eight on the property because they know that the government will give them money. Um, a lot of the, you know, there's something called the working poor. Okay. And I know a lot of people who are the working poor. I'd like to know if there still is a middle class because it seems like it's either you're either rich or you're poor. Now I'm not faulting rich people at all. You know, if you're successful, you know, you have every right to that success. But the bottom line is, I think that in regards to the housing issue, they forget, a lot of these owners forget they're dealing with people, okay? All right, Mr. Gross, we're coming up on the end here, so I'm going to ask you to just wrap it up real quick, please. Thank you. So a lot of these people forget, you know, a lot of these owners forget that they're dealing with people rather than dollar signs. Affordable housing is not going to be an easy solution. There is a solution there, but we've got to work together to find it. All right, great. We're coming up on the end here since this is just an hour. Uh, we're going to do our closing statements. You'll each have two minutes for that. So we're going to end. Let's see. How about you, Mr. Gillette? Closing statement. You have two minutes. Thank you. Well, like I said, I'm not a polit politician. I don't have a political record. I, I'm a citizen that is a retiree from the military. I spent 35 years of my life some eight, from age 17 uh, when I joined, I attained the rank of Command Sergeant Major in those 35 years. 1% of the U.S. population joins the military. I'm 0.08% of that 1% that attains the rank of Command Sergeant Major. This wasn't done uh, just by hanging around. This is a body work for my entire military career. Uh, I've served in the Middle East. I've served in the former Soviet Union. I've served in Central and South America. Uh, I believe that my military service has given me insight into not only our country, but how other people across the globe live. Uh, we, we have a great constitution and we need to fight for that. COVID is what drug me out. I'm supposed to be home retired with my kids, but the COVID restrictions that were completely unconstitutional, the CDC moratorium on rents that was completely unconstitutional and deemed so by the US Supreme Court, uh, that's what drove me out. The school's closing and watching the degrada degradation of my kids um, forced me to get involved. I did a FOIA request with the county. I uncovered a lot of stuff that was going on with uh, COVID restrictions and infighting within, within our own county, but I did not see a lot of my local politicians. Now, giving Leo props, he stood up, he fought, he fought for us, but I didn't see anybody else fighting for us. Uh, that constitutional, uh, Injury. Well, I will call it an injury. They injured our constitution. They closed businesses, although the box stores got to stay open, little mom and pop shops had to close, and we actually had people telling us to stay home in our house. That, that is a complete and total violation of the constitution that 
I just can't stand for. I have seven-year-old kids. We have to leave our kids a better country than, than we have now. Our founding fathers, some of the most brilliant speakers and thinkers of our time, wrote this constitution after a revolution. They put this country together knowing that we would have this turmoil and they gave us a document to use. We, we've got to follow the constitution. We have to have normal, I won't use the word normal. We have to have citizens, everyday average citizens like myself, a military retiree, come out of the woodwork, do our time, do our best effort, and then go back home. We, we can't stay in the House and Senate for, for years and years and years. I believe the Founding Fathers had the right idea. You go and serve your time. You go back to the farm. You let the next guy come forward and do his best job. Um, that's that's right. clean. Oh, am I out of time? Somewhat. I was Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right. Uh, last closing comments from Mr. Rosen. Thank you. Let me say, I'm a patriot. I'm not a politician. I've never served in public office. I've run for public office before, but of course, uh, I, it didn't happen. Mainly because that the system did, you know, the, the, the ones that I was running against uh, did not want honest people in office. I can honestly tell you that right now we are losing our country. We're being invaded via the, via the southern border. We have uh, problems with election integrity. I think right now we sh the uh, the legislature should not even sign a die until we have election integrity. The bottom line is is that I've stood on street corners. I've done my due diligence as a constitutional conservative. I've fought for con I've I've been around since the days of the Tea Party. I'm a small business owner. I'm doing this because I feel that I was called to serve, and um, I really believe that we need to put God back in this country. We need to, to put traditional learning back into the schools. We need to end the indoctrination of children. There's a lot of things that I, I can say that we have a great country, but it's right now on life support because we have, we need people to get involved. We need patriots at every single level running all the way down the school board. This is, this is our, a call to action. This may be the last free election that we have. This election is very important. I am hoping that when I get in there, you will see a true fighter because I am a watchdog. And, you know, I stood, like I said, I stood on street corners. I have fought for my country in my own way, not in the same way John has, because I thank him for his service. He is a veteran and he has served this country. But right now I am serving it the best way that I know how. And we need to get our country back. We should not be sitting idly by while our country is being pillaged and raped. OK, and I hate and I know that's a strong word, but the bottom line is, is that we need to our country. We're losing our country right now. We're seeing the veil of communism. We need to fight. Every single one of us should be standing up for our country right now. I am hoping to be that fighter in the legislature that is needed right now, because right now we don't need politicians. We need activists in the legislature, watchdogs that are going to fight for you, the people, and best and represent you the best way we can. I don't. I don't want. You know. I believe in term limits. Okay. I don't want to be there any more than I need to be. But right now we got a lot of problems that need to be fixed. And I believe that I am the person to fix them. Now, I can't solve all the problems, okay? A lot of times I got to lean on God, but I will tell you this. I will do my damnedest to make sure that Arizona is a constitutional state again, because we got to put God back in this state as well, as well as this country. And all I'm right. going to fight as well as I can for the people and the people of the state of Arizona. Thank you very much. This concludes our debate to our candidates. We thank you so much for participating. To the voters, we thank all of you who took the time to watch the debate and inform yourselves before the August 2nd primary election. As a reminder, the voter registration deadline is July 5th and early voting begins on July 6th. All registered voters, including independent voters, can participate in the primary. We encourage you to visit azcleanelections.gov for official accurate voting information. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thanks.